Hi everyone, my name is Fedor Cherwinski. I'm Computer Vision Lab lead at Arrival in Berlin. And today I'm going to speculate a little bit about reinforcement learning for industrial robotics. So the connection of Arrival to industrial robotics is very straightforward. Arrival produces electric vehicles, so you can go to our website arrival.com and see some examples. And the important part of our mission is how do we manufacture those vehicles. And we want to shift from building huge factories that produce only very specific models to smaller factories that can produce any kind of design of vehicles. And this can be only done by allowing robots to be much more flexible and the factory itself to be much more flexible. So this, this requires quite novel approach to robotic operations in general. So first, I'm gonna talk about the state of industrial robotics and um, why does it require the new technologies such as reinforcement learning, then the history of reinforcement learning for robotics, then about existing applications and the rest of the presentation will be actually going through our slides from our workshop presentation from ICRA this year in June about our experience with the reinforcement learning for robotics that we do in Arrival. And we'll finish with some takeaways. What is industrial robotics first? So we, we, we can imagine like robotics in general is pretty much obvious. We, everyone can imagine a robot. And then there is a very distinct border. Industrial is basically everything which is not consumer. And um, here, you can imagine like consumer robots to be like like your vacuum, vacuum cleaner or grass clipper or any, anything else like this. Um, but for industrial, the robots basically are in three groups that like two main groups here um, are AMRs, which, is, which stand for a, out, autonomous mobile robots. So like on the top image, uh, like the robot that can move itself freely in the space. It can be wheeled robot, it can be a real robot, it can be legged robot as well. So legged robots are somewhere in between industrial and consumer because we still don't know like all the applications, for example, of the Boston Dynamics spot. So it can be considered both like industrial and consumer. And the second big group is um, here I put it like N, D, O, F. So like some degrees of freedom manipulator. So like on the bottom images, like very, very typical manipulators that you can see in many, many factories nowadays in all of like all, like most of the major automakers use them. Normally N is from three to seven degrees of freedom. And those are two big, big groups that like we, sh we, we should talk about when we talk about industrial robotics. So what is the trend right now in the, in the robotics? So on the, on the top left is like the schematic picture of a typical factory for like, I'm gonna talk today a lot about automotive because I'm, I work for automotive company, but most of it is applicable for any large scale production pretty much. So yeah, I will, I will always refer to automotive industry here, but yeah, it doesn't mean it's not, it's, not, it's, only, it's only by sort of <clears throat> automakers, they sort of set the trend for other automation, let's see. So on the top left image is the typical, like a typical conveyor, like basically like a production line, which looks more or less like a conveyor. So it's very linear and there are a lot of robots and they're doing like every robot is doing its particular thing that is sort of hard coded. So every robot knows exactly its trajectory. So it should perform the steps and the exact timing. And um, the kind of a shift that, that is happening right now that people understand that this is not very flexible and not very, not very scalable maybe so that the, um, the new approach that is proposed by many companies that is called like the, 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 like is a big part of what's considered to be called industry 4.0 is a sort of so-called matrix approach when the robots are now placed into 
so-called robotic cells, right, like on the bright image. And uh, each robotic cell, the, the cells can be more or less identical. So the details can be like deviate, like tooling of the robots and maybe something else, some materials available in the cells, but the cells, they are interchangeable and the um, overall production flow is now much more flexible. It can be rescheduled, rerouted. So you can imagine like the material flow is going through those, through the matrix and it can be dynamically rerouted. And now also what is important that the flow itself of the materials is not supported by the conveyor belt or any kind of a such hardware, but it is now robots as well. So now mobile robots will be transporting all the materials between cells from one cell to another. And this is important. So on the bottom image, the, another part of this like paradigm shift is happening, which is like the fixed infrastructure, which was a conveyor belt is shifting to first it was automated vehicles. So automated guided vehicles, AGVs so-called. This is what was the like trend maybe for last 10 years in warehouses. So basically there are robots that they have kind of rails then th those rails can be um, magnetic or can be optical, but more or less there are still rails. So the um, infrastructure supports very limited motion of the robots. And now it is like, it's called now autom autonomous mobile robots. So like from AGVs, we go to AMRs and mobile robots are supposed to be moving freely in the space, choosing their own route. So still there are gonna be some rules of the of the road and like some lanes and the intersection rules and imaginary traffic lights and this kind of stuff. But uh, once again, this is now much, much more flexible. So it requires AMR to think itself, like so, so to react to the environment and to be able to localize itself so much bigger requirements for the robot itself. And this is what important for us. So. So the both parts of the trend, they require now robots to be much more flexible in sort of in terms of operations that can, they can perform. And now about the reinforcement learning part. So reinforcement learning is like known to go through like sort of a winter that started in 1980s. And um, it's interesting that even before that winter, so it's in 80s, you can find some papers about like how reinforcement learning can be used for robotics. And after the winter with the uh, arise of, of uh, clue learning and um, like reinforcement learning for video games for learning from raw pixels, uh, like pretty soon robotic applications started to appear. And um, the most famous people and actors in, the, in this field, they all somehow participate in this, in the in the reinforcement learning, trying to solve robotic tasks. Those are Abel and the um, Berkeley group, Levin, Stanford and Google Brain and DeepMind, OpenAI and NVIDIA that has its own robotics division now. And also interestingly, there are corporations from, from the industry world, let's say Siemens and KUKA, they also participate in this, uh, like development of reinforcement learning for robotics. And the problems that typically people are trying to solve, at least in academia, they are more or less the same. So they're about how you manipulate objects with the robot. <clears throat> uh, and also how do you navigate a mobile robot? So, so regarding manipulators, it's normally um, some well-known and widespread tasks like grasping and like pick and place task stacking objects, some other very more specific manipulations with the object and for mobile robots is navigation and uh, re reaching the goal given um, some, sometimes you need to reach a goal that is provided you like in a natural language. This is more like a consumer robotics application but like Facebook also works a lot in this field. Um, they simulate the task when the robot is somewhere in the apartment and you say like, please go to the 
uh, to the fridge and the robot needs to like map the environment and understand what the fridge is and where is it, where is it. <clears throat> and one of the kind of interesting, very, very challenging um, tasks for control is, for example, a flexible objects manipulation. So for example, when you have, you have a piece of clothes or, or a wire or a rope, and you need to do something with this rope with the having having a robot with the gripper. So there are certain papers now about this, and they and this the problem itself is quite quite interesting. So it's hard to simulate and very interesting dynamics. And so the the story of the methods is it all actually started normally is like starting from supervised learning and imitation learning. So you're trying to so you have some expert or you have some something that can show how to do the task and you're just trying to imitate and generalize and learn to perform the same task by copying an, an expert and this seems to be like pretty soon you see that it's not working and it's not generalizing good enough and then you switch to rl so then rl so for example for the grasping tasks that that, that was the google brain story so they started this large scale data collection project, which is very um, like, for me, it's quite um, classic already. So the, this is like the, the, this kind of picture pictures you may have seen where they had uh, like dozens of robots. So the, the lab is like, um, like army of robots. I call it like your robot academy, but it seems like there is no such term as uh, I imagined that. Um, but the, all those robots, they, they are doing like the same task over and over. Uh, They're trying to grasp something from a bin with the like clutter objects, or they're trying to open a door here. And they just, with some heuristics, for example, some sometimes they, they just trying to like, for example, grasp an object and then the, you register it was a success or not. And then you collect like tons of this data and you're trying to supervisedly in a supervised manner learn what is the successful grasp. And then you're trying to learn how to perform successful grasps. But this <clears throat> turned out to, to be not very scalable. So they shifted towards uh, like reinforcement learning setup. But like what is showing the, the biggest success at the moment is actually the com combination of both when you have the reinforcement learning, but you start from some, which is called behavioral cloning, um, or maybe it's again, imitation learning. So, so you have some expert and you have some uh, demonstrations. And then like most of the groups that work with real robots and then some real more, more or less real tasks, they, nowadays somehow use this kind of imitation learning so some demonstration of experts and jumpstart the training from from demonstrations and this allows you to to train much faster at least and also interestingly people started using representation learning more and more so when you're trying to in an unsupervised manner from just no label not labeled data learn some representation for example if you want to uh, train a controller which will take the, an image as input so you you can train some encoder first before actually training reinforcement learning a, a, a agent a actor and also seem to realize quite important so we'll show how it works for us so when you use simulation a lot like heavily for uh, domain randomization and training in simulation and you're trying to transfer it to the real world <clears throat> So about existing applications. So actually very interestingly, so at the moment I would say like, again, this is as far as I know, but there is only one um, company that is known to be doing something which is more or less real. So they deployed uh, their applications to the real sorting center in this case. Um, and it's called Covariant AI and it's being led by the well-known Peter Abel, which is again, the professor of reinforcement learning in Berkeley. 
and um, but there there are question marks because it's actually not very clear if the thing that they deployed that is working so so i don't have a video here but there is a robot uh, which can uh, grasp there there is a vacuum gripper and it's given some arbitrary objects in the in the box i need to grasp those objects and sort them into other beans and then um, grasping is basically sucking with the this vacuum sucking cup or like um, vacuum gripper so the the whole task is how to choose an optimal point for the gripper to to suck to an object um and it's uh, it looks pretty simple but seems seems like for them it was a lot of it's, it's been a lot of challenges and um, they mentioned on their website that they do a lot of reinforcement learning they affiliated a lot with berkeley and I think all of the co-founders are from the from this lab, but they actually don't explicitly mention if it if if the thing working on the robot is uh, reinforcement learning trained or not. So they just mentioned that it's machine learnings, but I expect it to be something again hybrid. So we don't know explicitly. <clears throat> um, yeah, and and when I've been like searching through like all all the all the other companies there are only research projects at the moment. So, and it's pretty much the same for our company. So today I'm gonna to talk about our research project and we still have high hopes that it will be like any time, not very soon, but it will be moving towards kind of production pipelines. But still right now we, yeah, we, we should be honest that this is a research project that we've done in our lab in Berlin. And um, this is how we presented it in ICRA. So it's the project called Sim to Reel for Peg Hole Insertion with Eye in Hand Camera. So um, many um, like specific terms here. So for Sim to Reel, I guess you already know what it is. Peg Hole Insertion is classic task uh, for robotics, for robotic assembly when you're trying to insert something into something. And eye in hand camera is when your camera is mounted on the manipulator and the factor. Um, this is also like um, this slang name for this kind of scenario. And we start from the results. Um, so here is the, um, the working like policy deployed on the real robot. So here you can see what is the bag, what is the hole and um, on the left is uh, like the snapshots, uh, like each frame is actually one state of, of environment. And on the bottom is observation of the network. So the, here the network, the policy network is working solely on the image, which is also grayscale from the camera mounted on the end effector. And uh, the output of this network is like where you should move to successfully insert the bag. And on the right, you see like moving in the steps. So it's actually steps of the actor uh, moving in real time. And you can see some interesting stuff that the insertion does not happen like straightforward from top down. It's actually going some, some strange trajectory. And if you look at the image, you will notice that this trajectory that actor is choosing is such that you see the hole uh, most of the time, so you don't cover the hole with the bag right away. So you you try start to move down a little bit, like shifted, and you adjust in the very very end. So you, you till the last uh, steps, you see the hole. So it, it like it helps you to orient. Um, this is how we like interpret the policy. Maybe it's not that smart. Maybe it's just a coincidence. But we we. Uh, like hope that it's actually the result of the training the um, controller end to end. So this is not uh, just a stupid reactive, um, like where to move right, left, top down. And um, because it's trained end to end, it can sort of have a kind of a st strategy, let's say. So what is the motivation of doing that? So as, as I said, we are, targeting like a flexible manufacturing and for flexible manufacturing means that the 
every time the robot receives some parts to one insert into another or something else, um, there is a lot of uncertainty about the parts themselves and about where they are placed. So we are here trying to resolve the uncertainty of parts placement. And uh, the straightforward way to do, to resolve that is to have external pose estimation, to have, again, like computer vision that will tell you exactly where the parts are. Um, but this can have some problems. Uh, so the, the, there are errors, there are occlusions, there are um, some problems uh, because of the like multiple transforms of between coordinate systems. So if you transform from camera coordinate system to the world coordinate system, then back to the robot coordinate system. So we have like all the errors summed up. And uh, we're just asking ourselves like, can a maximal precision closed vision control loop be trained? So if we if we really, the robot, the, the end effector that is doing the insertion, like estimating the relative position and uh, reacting on that directly, so we're trying to um, like collapse all the errors into a single thing. And why training, like why machine learning, like obviously because we are lazy, we don't want to do much programming, but like just want to leave it and it will train and we'll do the, the, do the thing ideally. So we want to like with every new scenario we need to solve, we don't want to write down like new heuristics and new algorithms, new controllers. <clears throat> so the experience setup we have, um, we chose like peg hole is just a good approximation for, for some real tasks that you may have like screwing or insertion. Um, it's like good model experiment. And in hand is, I think that we think that it serves best for our idea of direct visual feedback, because if you place a camera outside, um, like you can imagine like if something is moving in the image, then it's like a small percentage of image will change and your agent need to like really have some kind of attention. But if you place the camera on the manipulator, when you move the manipulator, your image changes dramatically and you can have a good idea of where are you moving and how, like what is changing and you're looking exactly on where things are happening and this is also like the, the closer you look the better you see so your re resolution increases towards like the most critical part of the task uh, so that's why we chose a simulator uh, which is called Capelle sim it's, it's a, like specialized simulator for robots of such kind and uh, for real environment, we have like the same robot, uh, Sierra 5 e Universal Robot, Universal Robotics, and uh, in a real sense, but we actually don't use depth, but just use it as a normal camera. And for comparison, we also implemented um, like a visual serving baseline. So we just implemented some heuristics based on the task. So very specific for the task that will de detect a hole and move the uh, pegged towards the hole um, and do we just come like to have something to compare. And um, yeah, so on the bottom, you can see like how the baseline is working and some like open CV tricks. It's quite, quite successful, but doesn't look very flexible as if you look at the implementation. <clears throat> yeah, so on the on the right, you can see like the how the training could look like. Uh, here we don't have a gripper, but it's actually could be important that the gripper looks like in the real world, and some TensorFlow graphs and some details like technical details you might find uh, interesting. So the observation is basically RGB image, and the rest is turned out to be not critical. So we thought that depth would help a lot, but it doesn't. And we also thought that the proprioception, like joint position will help a lot, but they don't. And um, like the, um, also we have some kind of a bit of domain randomization, which helps. And um, like policy is a quite simple convolutional neural network. And for 
uh, training algorithm, we chose TD3. So we have obviously we started from DDPG and because we have continuous control and we want to do off policy because we want to be not, not don't want to train for long. And um, we also tried so author critic, but it showed somehow worse results. So we didn't spend too much time on um, tuning the hyperparameters. So TD3 after all worked best for us. And what's important here, important to mention, yeah, we used catalyst to play with different algorithms and their hyperparameters. And it was really, really help, helpful along the way. So the, the overall success story of our integration with Catalyst, you can read in our Medium blog that we recently showed um, that is now in, in PyDart Road. And yeah, so, so for the action space, we constrained ourselves here to 3D, but it can be actually extended to 6D, but here we move the robot only like in X, Y, Z. And the, for the reward, it's also a kind of interesting story. So we, we started uh, from like shape, like giving a reward for everything. So with like the, the most obvious idea here is to have a like smooth reward for distance. Um, and it's um, here, like the just the di any distance you travel towards the goal, you being rewarded proportionally. But also we wanted to add like reward for success state reaching some like like a uh, sparse reward, uh, some negative reward for collisions, and also like reward negative reward each time just because like we want to finish earlier. But it turned out that you can like do as well with just having the smooth distance reward. So it does all the, all the tasks. And um, here on the graphs, you, go, you can also notice that the like robot really fast learns how to reach the mating part, but not inserting. And the insertion happens like like sometimes randomly and then after sometimes experiencing the insertion randomly the agent learns to like, like consistently insert every time. So the takeaways of this particular experiment was like quite interesting so with the, the proprioception is not required so the image can be enough so, so it, it can be even uh, important because like proprioception uh, is like absolute, so so the, the, it's, it's an absolute frame of the robot, but the image is also always relative. So you can start in any part of your table and um, you just need to move relative, relatively to the goal. And um, in terms of proprioception, it can be very different states, but in terms of image and in terms of required motion, it's, it's gonna be all the same. Um, so the, we, we also experimented a lot with depth from, from stereo, from, from real sense, but it should to um, show very specific kind of noise, um, and the, you can see it on the on the right top image. So the real sense depth is very noisy, and when you start training with the depth in simulation, the depth in simulation is obviously much better, and you need to really specifically simulate this very specific kind of noise, which is like very challenging task in itself. So we decided just to abandon using depth. Um, and we also learned that calibration, like the camera to, to end effect recalibration is very important. So to, to close the seam to real gap, um, obviously. And then, yeah, some numbers. So how much does it take to train on GPU? We still experience a lot of illumination sensitivity. So this is just, yeah, we just understand that we need more domain randomization maybe. And um, also very interesting stuff that we trained it on the peg, which was like one centimeter smaller in diameter than the, the hole. And then we just changed the peg to be bigger and it somehow inserted again. So, so like maybe again, it's heavy coincidence, but seems like it generalized to align the peg to the hole it doesn't really depend how, how big is the bag with respect to the hole. <clears throat> and as I said, like we also 
it looks like the controller is optimizing visibility of the target also that there is a strategy to always approach the hole from the side which is which makes the situation more visible um so yeah so the, this was the um, the project but the project like sh showed some kind of success but we still see that is very hard to still it took a lot of time it, a lot of time to tune the hyperparameters to set up the environments also to really manage the sim to real transfer and looking at the industry we see that there is still seems like two to five years to see this to be applied to the real factories but we still hope that like we will take active part in that and um, but also another good trend that we see that more and more complicated and domain specific environments is appearing so for example for this capella sim uh, simulator is recently the um, rl bench framework was open sourced which is which is like actually a lot of different environments with the robots that need to solve like some uh, tasks like open a cabinet like, or, or pour a water into a bottle and to, into a glass from a, from a bottle, like this kind of tasks. Um, they are being now uh, just open sourced as new gym environments. And um, I think like the more and more this kind of specific environments we'll see, the more and more we will see um, some kind of uh, meta learning and uh, this kind of hybrid approaches from dem demonstration to reinforcement learning um, to be more and more applicable to more complex and real world tasks. And also regarding meta learning and this kind of um, trending uh, topics in reinforcement learning, we see that they also there is also a, a lot of a lot of work in this direction on how how do you ship your something something that you trained on on simulation for example to real world and how do you reuse the the models that you have trained for different tasks and um, this is also looks very this looks very promising but the initial problem that we tried to solve that like we thought that it's going to be easier to train than to program that is still um doesn't hold so so it seems like it's still easier to program a robot to do specific particular tasks than, than to train it to do it hoping that it will like generalize to all other tasks so yeah this is this sounds maybe not very optimistic but we are optimistic and we really see a lot of pro progress happening in the academia and we see some movement in the industry and from the industry from the companies like Siemens and KUKA also experimenting in this direction so we really hope that we will see more and more applications of the reinforcement learning to industrial robots in the future so thanks for your attention i'm happy to answer your questions <laughs>